this awesome Easter basket. It's filled with fun activities for your kids and your family so that you can think about the resurrection for weeks to come. And I, <clears throat> let, let us go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment and unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, and the King of kings and lords of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in an approachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see to him be honor in eternal dominion. Amen. Please bow your heads as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let's all stand together as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to me. Holy, 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 merciful and Amen. You may be seated. He is risen. Yeah, he is. We do not serve 
a God that you can find in the tomb because he has risen. Uh, just to let you know, if you look on our uh, bulletin on the back of that, there's some opportunities that we're going to be gathering over the next month. Uh, there's a luncheon for ladies, April 7th. We have man lunch, uh, April 17th, and then April 21st that evening. Uh, you will want to make sure to sign up for that with our taters, talents, and treats. Uh, that is, our students are going to be doing a dinner for us. Uh, they'll be doing a talent show, and then there will be uh, dessert, uh, kind of silent auction that we'll be doing, and all of those proceeds that help our students to go to camp. Uh, so it is a fun time. It is a good time. And you'll want to make sure and sign up for that. I would mention the senior adult lunch, but you're not going to sign up anyways. You'll just come. So that is that is just fine. I'm going to go ahead and read from Luke chapter 24. Uh, Luke chapter 24, the resurrection of Christ is recorded in all three of the Gospels. We were here this last Friday night and we had a great time looking at the crucifixion story through the seven statements of Jesus on the cross. Uh, so here, Luke's gospel, he writes this. He says, But on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, uh, at early dawn they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them like an idle tale, and they did not believe. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping, looked in, and he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding as you walk? And they stood still and looking at him, they said, then one of them named Clopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And they said, and he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is towards evening that day and is now far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us when he would talk to us on the road while he opened the scriptures to us? And after that, they rose the same hour, and they returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven who were there, and they gathered together, saying, the Lord is risen indeed, he has appeared to Simon, and then they told what had happened on the road. And how he had made known to them the breaking through the breaking of the bread. 
And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. But he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. That is, I myself touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words, and I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled." And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you were clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him. And he returned to Jerusalem, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you rose your son, Jesus, from the dead. Thank you that he has risen. Thank you that he has appeared. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James. For Joanna and the other women who were there who were faithful to share the message of the risen Savior to the apostles. Lord, we thank you how it is Christ who is this way that we understand all of the scriptures. And Lord, we ask that today you would open our eyes and open our hearts to see the truth of Jesus in your word. And Lord, like those two men on the road to Emmaus, I pray that you would burn within our hearts that we might know you, that we might know your son who has come to bring peace by the blood of the cross and he can give that because he has risen. And let us be faithful, proclaiming these things in his name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we continue to sing about the resurrection. You're here. You're not really sure why we're singing some of these songs. You catch me after, and I'll gladly have some conversation with you. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin, your love made a way. was redeemed, only beauty remains. My open heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, oh, Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made. 
blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will joy in the resurrected Savior this morning. We love you and praise you. It is in Christ's name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. You guys can have a seat. Our kids aged kindergarten through fourth grade can head through the back doors. Miss Candace is waving her hand back there. You can follow her down. Parents, please make sure they have their security tags on so that we can match them up with you at the end of the service. If they don't have a security tag, we can help them get one very easily. If you have your copy of the Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have one of our little scripture journals, we do have some available for you if you'd like. It's, that is page 56. We're going to jump ahead there. 50, chapter 15, longest chapter, most detailed uh, defense of the resurrection of Jesus. As you're turning there, let me ask you a question that may fill your lunchtime conversation today. And that is, if you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? This is a fun one to do with kids. Uh, It is fun when people actually take it very serious and argue about it, but I sometimes find that that is enjoyable. If you could have a superpower, would you want to fly? Would you want superhuman strength? Would you want to be able to speak multiple languages? Would you be able to, would you want to be able to breathe underwater? Would you want to jump super high? Would you want to never sleep? Some of you are like, no, I want to always sleep. I'm the reverse. But you know, if you had any of those, you can discuss those at lunch with your kids and which one that you want. But if you could have any of those, you know what would still happen? You would still die. The superhuman strength would eventually wear out. Those of you that would fly, if it would be me, I would probably run into something. You want to hold your breath underwater, that's fine. You could still get eaten by a shark or a whale. What if I told you there was this superpower that you could have that though you may die, you will live forever? This is what the resurrection of Jesus teaches us, that is available for us, that though we die, we can live forever. And part of Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But in many ways, this is actually what we do every Sunday. We always celebrate Him rising again, Him rising from the dead. So if you're a believer here today, I hope that you leave here encouraged because of the truth and the impact of the resurrection of Jesus. 
reading verses, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Let's read this, and then we'll have a quick word of prayer. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. They've been divided. They've had some questions, and he brings them into the truth of the resurrection. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James and then to all apostles, last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. From the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I. But the grace of God that is with me, whether it was I or they, so we preach and you believed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, let this telling of the gospel not be in vain for those who hear, but rather, Lord, would you open our eyes to the truth of your Son, your resurrected Messiah. Lord, help me as I speak to be clear. Let those who listen hear from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Kind of our big idea that will frame what we're looking at today is that believing in the gospel, to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ for your eternal gain. It is the resurrection of Jesus. It is the pivotal moment in all of life. And how and what you believe about Jesus and his resurrection will determine your eternity. Paul's talking to people who think that they are wise. He is speaking to a church who is having arguments about who is the most spiritual and wise, Paul is writing here saying, if you want to truly be spiritual, if you want to truly be wise, then it must be that you rightly understand and believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Some people today will say that they are spiritual but not religious. Paul would disagree, saying that you have made a fabrication And you are religious and not truly spiritual because you are not following the truth, which is the truth of the resurrected Messiah. Since all truth, all true spiritual truth begins with Jesus Christ risen from the dead. We're going to kind of frame this in two ways. And the first thing that we'll look at is those who believe in the gospel for gain. Those who believe in the gospel for gain. The writer of Hebrews says, The good news came to us just as it did to them, uh, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So those who hear the word of the gospel and believe, it is a beneficial for them for gain, for eternal gain, if we listen and we have faith. Three words will help us kind of frame this, and that is the words, remind the word raised, and the word reliable. Look at what it says in verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you. Paul is here and he's not giving them a new message. This is not new information for them because that Jesus Christ rose on the third day is the very basic foundational truth of the gospel. He's, I'm reminding you of this. He had told them before. Some of you need reminders for lesser things. I need to be reminded at 3.30 every day that I'm supposed to be thinking about going home sometime soon. I have a reminder on my phone. I'm one of those. I just get involved in something, and then my wife has called me five o'clock. Five. Where are you? I'm like, I totally lost track of the time. So I have a reminder on my phone. Some of you students and some of you kids, because we're planning on going to camp with our, with our kids and with our students, you have to be reminded to bathe regularly and to use soap to change your t-shirt. You guys are laughing because you're not the ones that is going to be a chaperone on these trips. It's a very serious conversation that we have. It's inevitable that the middle schoolers end up smelling like their roommate. Not smelling well, but smelling poor. They need reminded of these things. 
The church needed reminded of the gospel. And then he gives kind of a series of statements, and some of your uh, translations will use the word which, which is what we have here. Some of your translations will use add the word also, but it's kind of this uh, phrase. It says, the gospel that you received, which you received, in which you stand, in which you are being saved. He's showing this progression that the gospel has been one that has been received, the one in which they're standing firm, and it is the process or the means by which people are saved. He says, this gospel, so we might ask the question, what is the gospel? At its base root, the word gospel means good news, and we have here in verses 3 through 5, the most succinct view and version of the gospel. Most people, most authors and believe that this is kind of like an early church creed, kind of a succinct statements of belief that is given in verses 3 through 5, because it kind of has that ring about it. And it says, for I deliver to you as a first importance, right? First importance, it says, it's also what I received. First, number one, that Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. Number Point number one about the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. He, he died for our sins. He didn't die for his own sins. Remember, Jesus is truly God and truly man. Because God the Father was his father. He had no earthly father. The sinful hereditary that we have, that sinful DNA, was not passed to him. And so he lived a life fully dependent on the Lord God, and he lived at all times loving God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength, loving his neighbor as himself, fully upholding the law and the requirements of it. But then he died for our sins. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You might remember the story in the book of Genesis where Abraham is walking up on the mountain with his son Isaac, and he's got the bundle of wood that's there, and he lays down his son Isaac on the altar, and he goes and he ties him down, and he's raised the knife ready there to prove his faith in the Lord, his belief. And God, and right before he's to strike his son dead, God provides a substitute ram for him. Abraham was able to do that because he had belief in God who would one day provide a substitute, not of a ram, but of his own son. And his name is Jesus. This is Good Friday that Jesus came, that he walked up on that Calvary, and he hung there on the cross. The sin of the world, our sin, was placed on him, and he died. And because he died for our sins, we can have forgiveness and redemption. It is as if maybe one was there. You can imagine if we were back a hundred, couple hundred years ago, there would be one who would be standing there on the gallows, ready to be hung. The noose would be fixed around their neck. And it is that one that is there that has come, and someone comes and reads this pardon from the king. The pardon can be read because the king's son has died in the place. Of them. He died for our sins. Next is he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. 700 years before the act, it says this in Isaiah 53 He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him, was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each has went to his own way. And the Lord laid the iniquity of us all on him. Jesus died on the cross for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And that he was buried, number two. He was buried. Because he was truly God and truly man, he truly died. They took his body off of that cross and they placed him in a tomb. It was real flesh and blood that died, that breathed his last. But then on the third day, number three, Christ was risen. He died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Number verse four, he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And the idea that saying that here he was raised, it is that God the Father raised his Son. And is this kind of the, the tense in Greek would show this permanence of it. That he was raised, 
and that he will always have this life. He was not resuscitated, right? He was truly dead, and then he became truly alive. And this was in accordance with the Scriptures. Hosea 6.2 says, After two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise up, that we may live before him. Jesus said, Jonah was as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. Psalm 16 10 says, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. This is why Jesus, speaking to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, showed them from Moses and the prophets and all the Psalms, everything prophesied about him that he would come and he would die. And then he says, Christ appeared. So Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, and Christ was raised. And then number four, Christ appeared. In the New Testament, there are ten instances of Jesus appearing to people with his resurrected body. Paul lists five. If you read the gospel accounts and Paul's, you'll see ten, there are five. He says first, look, it says, uh, verse 5, and he appeared to Cephas, that's the Aramaic name of Peter, and then to the twelve, and the idea of saying the twelve there is he's talking about the disciples. At this time, the twelve were actually eleven because of Judas, but they're using the term the twelve to be in a title faction, in, in a title fashion, so to the, to the disciples. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom who are still alive. Remember that this was written within 30 years, 25 years of this happening. Some of you can remember things that happened 25 years ago. Do you remember Y2K? We're sharing with our daughter about that. And uh, she's like, that is a long time ago. And I was like, I was an adult when that happened. She's like, Daddy... You are old. She's grounded now. Uh, so he's appeared to 500, verse 7. He appeared to James and then all the apostles at one time and then to Paul on the road to Damascus. And it is the resurrection of Jesus which is reliable information. The resurrection of Jesus is the only thing that explains the difference in the life of the disciples. Because they went from hiding and running from those who killed Jesus to though then boldly proclaiming that he, had raised from the, he was raised from the dead. It is not that Jesus' body was somehow resuscitated in a cold tomb. He was beaten, scourged, flogged, whipped, and crucified. It is not that he was able to drag himself out. No one would follow that. You would look at him and have pity. He's not taking to the ICU. He was walking around and he was appeared with them on the road to Emmaus and then he was not. And then he appeared in the room. He had new life. We worship on the first day of the week. Because we weakly remember the resurrection of Jesus. The reason that they, the disciples switched from worshiping on Saturday, which is the Jewish Sabbath, to worshiping on Sunday is because of the resurrection of Jesus. They went from denying Jesus to being murdered for him. Chuck Colson, the chief staff for Nixon, he said this. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. And then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years and never once denied it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, or put in prison. They would not have endured that if it wasn't true. He says, Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world. And they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. The truth of the resurrection is well documented. But there are non-biblical sources that will testify to various things. Earthquakes, sun being darkened, people appearing. 
Paul writing here to the church within 30 years of this event saying 500 of these people are still alive. You can go and ask them. Jesus rose from the dead. But maybe you don't believe that because this is the Bible. And you're more of a person of history. You like things with a bit more document to proof and more provenance there. Maybe you study the classics and you like Homer, not Simpson, but the guy that wrote the Iliad. We like that. We've read that in school. Some of you are reading that in school and some of that is the bane of your existence. Or some of you are like, yes, that is a good story. We should trust that. It was originally written in 900 B.C. The earliest copy we have is 400 B.C. It's just a mere 500 years difference. We've got 643 copies of that great work. Say, well, James, I'm not much of, you know, I don't like some of that Greek stuff, but I'm more of a philosophy guy, okay? More of a history, philosophy type person. So you got Herodias, he wrote histories. This is all of our ancient Greek history, all of our ancient history comes off of Herodias. This is great, written in 425. The earliest copy, BC, earliest copy we have is 980. I've got a little bit more of a time span here, but that's okay because we're going to believe Herodias, right? 1300 year time span, that doesn't actually matter. We have eight copies of that, but I'm sure those eight are really good, right? Oh, Plato. Tetralogies is where his Plato's dialogues are at. Written in the 420s BC. Earliest copy as of 900 AD. And just a mere 1,200 years. And those, Plato, we've had to read those in school and in class. Seven copies. And we're going to not, we will not question Herodias' history. We're not going to question Plato. You're going to read Homer's Iliad without doubt or question. Now, we're going to come to the New Testament. We have all of these doubts and questions. We're not going to look into them ever, but we're going to just accept these things on fact. You've got Aristotle, wrote his Metaphysics and Ethics, written in the 340s. Oh, that's not as good, 1100 A.D. Challenging. Time span 1,400 years and a whopping 49 copies. But these are all, James, these are all older. What about something that's more recent to the time of Jesus? Like Julius Caesar. He, he li- so wrote the Gaelic Wars. He, he lived between 144 BC. He probably didn't write it at 100 when he was born, probably closer to the time that he died. Don't know, but that's his lifespan. Earliest copy you have is of 900 AD, 1,200 year time span. Julius Caesar, A2 Brute. Ten copies. Not going to question that at all. Because I can read to you stories about, the, about Christ Jesus being risen from the dead. You say, no, that's, that can't be true. The New Testament. Written between 50 and 90 A.D. Earliest copy. This is for the skeptics in the room, dating it at 150 most people would date it in the 130s. I'm giving you 20 years. Roughly 60 years. Of the Greek manuscripts, the first ones that were written, we've got 5,800 plus copies. If you want to use early Latin that started in the 350s, you're going to take it in, in Coptic versions. We've got 24,000 that are written. The earliest copy that we have is of John 18, P52. What you see on the screen there is actually a manuscript P46. That's split between the University of Michigan, Sar, Ohio State, and a museum in Ireland that has this in P46 there. That's actually our text for this morning. That's 1 Corinthians 15. You can see the kind of the corner's been, been messed up just a little bit. But there, P, this, this document, P46, has the entirety of Paul's epistles that are listed there. And that was written in the mid-250s, and we, we have those. There's over 5,000 of those that are written. And even if you want to discount all of the thousands of those copies, if we just take the early church fathers, guys like Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Athanasius, their letters, Justin Martyr lived in the 150. If we take just their writings, their letters, and their sermons, we can reproduce the entirety of the New Testament just in their correspondence with other people. And all of this, done within a very short period of time. So James, what about all the differences? Well, if you look at all of the differences, you see the differences between you and y'all, and the or a. 
But I don't think most of that information is for the choir. That information should bolster our faith who do believe in Jesus. But Paul doesn't say it is just those who believe with faith here in this text. There's another group of people, both that he is writing to, and another group of people in this room. And it's those who believe the gospel, but believe in vain. If you watch some of the superhero stories, and please don't ask me to explain any of them to you. If you need that, you can please speak with Stephen. They all blend together for me. There are various movies and shows about a superhero coming of age and coming and learning that they have a new superpower. Some of you are like, you're, you're, you're beginning to, to track it in the multiverse now, and it's, it's all a it's stew for me. It doesn't make sense. I watch it, but I can't delineate it. But you know, all those stories are really good, but you know what wouldn't happen is we wouldn't watch a movie, maybe you would, I wouldn't watch a movie for two and a half hours about a superhero who has these powers that decides to take the blue pills like, nah, I'm just going to be an accountant. Don't, I don't want to have any of this superhero crime fighting, enemy defeating type thing. I mean, it would be a total letdown. It would be like for those of you that watched, you know, however many seasons of Lost, you're just mad at the end of it. For me, it was watching the, the movie A Perfect Storm in high school. I'm a fisherman. I love that, and I watch. They catch all of this fish, and then, you know, here's the spoiler. They all die at the end, and I was mad that they died, and the fish were ruined. Was, this is awful. Watch a movie to feel bad. I want to watch a movie and feel good. I'll watch a movie about a superhero that's like, nah, I'm going to just forget all of this superhuman strength and flying around business. Let me do some math. Show me an Excel spreadsheet. This sounds great. I'd be so mad. Like, what good is that? It's in vain. It's useless. Paul is talking here about those who believe maybe these facts of the gospel, but it has no effect or change in your life. So as we looked at kind of three words, remind, raised, and reliable about believing the gospel for gain, those who believe the gospel in vain, three words can help us. is the, the word past, the word personal, and the word pleasure. Word vain there, you can see it in verse 2. He says, if you hold fast to the word I preached unless you believed in vain. If you are one who believes in vain, it is one where there is no purpose or effect There's no present day implication of the belief in Jesus. All of your belief in Jesus is in the past. Like Y2K, right? It was something that you heard, that you agreed to, but there's no present change in your life. This is not a contradiction to a phrase that you've heard in a Baptist church, once saved, always saved. But we have so diminished the idea of the eternal security of a believer to say that if you walked an aisle, repeated a prayer, or you raised your hand, or maybe even you went as so far as to get dunked, that you're good, you're set, you're sealed forever. The Bible is very clear about those who have done these religious things who do not continue in the faith. This is the parable of the sower and the seeds. The seeds that are planted amongst the rocky soil and amongst the thorns. Who, whose life is extinguished because of the cares of the world or because of persecution because of the word. Those who do not continue holding fast the message of the gospel may have done one of those acts, but it has been in vain because there's no present change in their life. This very construction of this, if you look at verse 2, he says, if you hold fast to the word that I preached, it is this future looking, this this bracing for impact. So I was thinking about this, there's the number of impacts that I've had in my life and collisions are many. So trying to think of a way that, so the only way that I could think about this, and it's probably not good, but don't ask me, I'll go, golf, I'll go to top golf with you, but I probably don't need to go to a golf course. Because I, I was on them too much as a kid, and I just can't see anything like that and not think, can we get this thing stuck? And I'm not going to ever walk on a golf course 
And so I'm going to get in a golf cart, and then we're going to drive it, and then we're going to see what happens. And I had a friend that you never would ever have him drive. Because when we went driving, his whole goal was to see where we could go and what could happen. And I have a distinct memory that is a nightmare in my life of him clinging on to me as we are barreling down a hill on a golf course. Oh, it's funny. Until the brakes stick and the wheel turns and we fly out. And he's like, James! And he's screaming. And the, the impact that we had against the woods and against the tree was monumental. Bracing for impact. I've never held another man like that. And I was uncomfortable then and I'm uncomfortable with it now. Right? We're flying out of that thing. I'm like, oh, and I'm, ho- I'm trying to turn him to make him take the brunt of the impact, right? <laughs> it's just awful. Paul said, you've got to hold, you to cling fast. You're going to br- what is this impact that we're waiting for? One day you all will stand before Jesus and give an account for your life. You will brace for impact for that moment with what have you done with the message of the gospel that you've heard? Has your belief in him been for gain and has it changed your life and it will be for a greater eternity or has it been in vain that you've heard the message but you've discarded it? You might discard it because you are more interested in personal prestige. But you know the truth of the gospel but you've been more interested in building your own world and following your own ways to build your own kingdom. You've worked hard at your own life And you don't want to be bogged down by God and His rules. You would be one who loves the world more than you love Jesus. You've wanted to build your own empire. So it's your personal prestige, but I I do want to say that there may be some of you here who there's some personal pain in your life. And there's a difficulty and a challenge. And you may even be here today under protest. And if that's you, I just want to say thank you for coming. I want to say thank you, welcome. There are some people who have have hurt in their life that they're so, so hard for them to reconcile because of this past pain. They're just not sure what to do. And it may be because people like myself Preachers have sold you a false bill of goods. We sold you a gospel of the good life. That somehow you've interpreted what we've said, and maybe we've even said it, that if you will follow Jesus, then all of these good things will happen. Life's going to be great and grand and wonderful. And you've bought that. And then life happens. Pain happens. Bad things happen to you. And that doesn't sink with your understanding of the gospel of the good life. And so now you might be here and you're mad at God, who you are not sure actually exists or not, but you're mad at Him. And so I want to recognize that there are some people that are like that today. I would tell you that if there's an evil that's been done to you, God did not do those actions, and that God is merciful and kind that He does not judge us for our evil actions. That the Lord does, He gives us this ability to act and to decide and to choose. He gives us a level of agency for which we are accountable. We are not some type of robots that God has made that He just moves pieces on a chessboard. We are real people with real wills, with real decisions, with real actions. We should not blame God for the evil actions of others, but recognize that evil actions do actually happen. And that is actually the the reason that Jesus came. God is not spared from your hurt. In fact, he says he is near the brokenhearted. God hates the evil that has happened more than you do. He sent His own Son to pay for those evil actions. And even for you, 
God has been merciful and kind to not bring immediate judgment to you in your life for the sins that you commit. Now, you may not be as bad as someone else, but the standard is not someone else who is worse, but rather Jesus who is perfect. And God has been kind and merciful to you. He sent His Son to come and to die that we might have new life in Him. So it might be this personal prestige that you follow. It might be a personal issue of pain why you no longer believe or you believe in vain. And it might be even your own pursuit of pleasure. There's a common word now, again, tossed around, this idea of deconstructing your faith. You've been raised in the church, you've heard these things, but now you're deconstructing. Most of the time, people that use that phrase use that phrase just so that they can sleep with their boyfriend or girlfriend. The amount of sexual immorality that is tagged to those who are deconstructing their faith is massive. Partly because if you will just look at the facts, it's irrefutable. But it is often this idea of, I want to do what I want to do, and I want this pleasure in my life. See, sin, sin distorts our affections. It distorts what we want. We want to be happy and we want to feel good, and so we do what makes us feel good. You work really hard so that you can enjoy life. You go to a job that you hate so that you can enjoy things in your own life. And you will even go and help other people. And the thing that you will say is, it makes me feel good. You'll give to needy causes. You'll volunteer places. Also at how it makes you feel. And the real wickedness of sin is that it distorts how you feel about things. It distorts your affections. And you know this because you have wanted all of these things in your life. And when you get them, you realize it's not enough. It doesn't matter what it is. You can ascend to the pinnacle of your job. You can have more money than you ever thought. Your house can be greater than you ever thought. Your retirement can be more optimistic than anything. You can finally get a date for prom. But you realize you're not satisfied. Because God did not make you to be satisfied or fulfilled by the things in this life. The things in this life wear out. Rust destroys them. You spend your money and it loses its buying power daily. But yet we work so hard for these things. The Bible says that God has written eternity on our hearts. God made you so that only as you know Him and only as you find your fulfillment in Him, only when you begin with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus can you be made whole and be fulfilled. This is not the gospel of fixing yourself up, but it is the gospel of coming to Jesus and knowing Him and submitting your life to Him, submitting all of who you are In your person, you submit all of your desires, affections, your pleasures, and that you would not rest with a belief in the past, but that you would presently hold fast to Jesus. And it may be that you are here today to hear this message, that you've been one who has believed in vain, but you have strayed so far off the path. Or it may be you are here and you think, I am so far from what Jesus requires. Please know, the gospel is not a gospel of come and fix yourself up. Look at who was the one who was saved. Look at verse 9. Paul says, I am the least of the apostles. Unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. If God can save a church-persecuting, Christian-murdering Paul, if His grace is sufficient for him, then friends, His grace is sufficient for you. But you can't come thinking that you have anything to add. You can't come thinking that you'll be accepted because of your good works, who you are. You are only accepted because of Jesus. 
But if you have believed in the past and there is no present change in your life, then you are one who has believed in vain. You're not fooling him. How crazy is it for you to recognize these things as truths but not live by them? See, he wants to change your life here, now, and forevermore. And what you did when you were eight is not sufficient. It starts somewhere, but it continues on. So were you one that has believed in vain? Or are you one who is believing for this eternal gain? You're not too far from him. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. You cannot earn that. You just receive it as Paul received it. It is of first importance. If you're a really good citizen, if you're a really good kid, if you're really making something of yourself, that's great. But the thing of first importance is that you would be reconciled to Jesus. Parents, your goal should not be that your kid becomes a contributing member of society, gets good grades, and goes to a good college. Because if they have all of those things of the world and yet lose their soul, a past belief is of no gain. First importance is that Jesus Christ died for sins, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose again, and then he appeared to all of these people. And you might be one here who believes all of this, but you might be tired You might be wondering, do I have to keep going on? I'm praying. I'm not seeing my prayers answered. I'm trying to share my faith, and I just feel like I'm not gaining any traction. It may be that you are one who has believed the gospel. You have trusted in Jesus, and you're trying to walk your faith out, but you keep trying to take the reins from him. That is not what God wants you to do. If you are saved by grace, you also live by grace. This idea of grace, it is a gift of God, but is the grace of God is this enabling power that he gives to people through faith. Look at what it says in verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. How do you know if it is not in vain? What if you are working By the grace of Jesus, for the kingdom of Jesus, for the proclaim and the glory of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That God gives us this grace that Paul says, this is how I was able to work harder than anyone else. If you are a believer here and you are dog tired and you are struggling even in your faith, it is a call for you to trust in the grace of Jesus. And to press into him and you trust in him to do his work through you. It is not so that you can be lazy. It is not a let go and let God, but it is a holding fast, a believing and a clinging to him and trusting that the grace of Jesus is sufficient for you. God's grace will sustain you. That illustration about the man who's there on the gallows, we can see him as noose is tied. We would all go there, right? We'd go there and watch the spectacle of this execution. We don't know what he did, but he deserved it. Can you imagine what would happen at your dinner table? That executioner comes, and he begins to read this pardon from the king. We would talk about that for years to come, right? That guy would be the luckiest man in the world. And see, I think when we share a story like that, a lot of times what happens is we're viewing that like we're in the audience, viewing this person who's about to die, instead of viewing ourselves in line, about to meet the same fate. See, it's not just that this pardon was written and given for someone else, but because of Jesus, this pardon is given for us. Some of my goal even this morning is to let you know that outside of Jesus, you're not okay. 
and you're not safe. That if your belief is in the past, if there's not a present holding fast, then the collision that waits at the end is not going to be good. But if you will trust in Jesus, if you will turn from yourself and you will presently hold fast by believing in him, by faith in him, then what it says in the scriptures can be true for you as it is true for me. It says of Jesus, he says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that Jesus died on the cross and paid for our sin, that we might be clothed with his righteousness. Acts that we have not deserved and that when we are given the righteousness of Christ, we are received by Jesus. And Jesus can offer that gift of forgiveness because he got up out of the grave. He didn't stay dead. He has new life. He can offer forgiveness because he defeated sin and he defeated death by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And this is the offer for you today, that you would believe in Jesus for eternal gain and that you today can have this new life. You can trust Jesus in your seed. In a moment, we're going to sing a song of response. You can trust him then. You can talk with me after. But let your belief in Jesus not be in vain of something in the past, but something in the present that was changing your life for this future gain. Will you believe in this, Jesus, for eternal gain today? Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would in your great kindness, not let any here be comfortable with a belief in vain. Lord, let those of us who believe in you for present and eternal gain find confidence and hope in your changing, life-changing grace. Lord, thank you for Jesus, the truth of his resurrection. And the grace offered in him, it's in his name we pray, amen. I'm going to ask that you stand as we sing this song of response. We'll sing the whole song as you sing it out from your heart to the Lord. The altar's open for you to be obedient to however the Lord is speaking to you. But don't leave here today. If you have questions about this, I would love to speak with you either down front or after. Stephen.
for our benediction. I want to leave you with Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a great Resurrection Sunday.